Welcome uh, for joining us. Uh, thank you for joining us here for uh, the, the Midwest University virtual uh, version sessions and uh, I appreciate it. So uh, Joe and myself, I'm Christopher, will be presenting on uh, the Revit Inception uh, as I'm sure all of you saw because you signed up. So uh, thank you again for attending. So I wanna start off, uh, well, of course with the welcome, but also, so, this was intended to be at Midwest University 2020, uh, so in, in March that year. And then, uh, because of you know, the lives we've lived this last little bit, it, it got, as you all know, I think, uh, moved to August 2020, and then that, that got canceled. So, so now we're in September 21, but we get to do it now, so I'm pretty excited. Uh, so Joe and I got to go back and go over things and see what's changed. And, the time that's happened and uh, got some good good stuff to talk about. So kick it off first. So I'm Christopher Alexander. So uh, Joe and I both work here at Progressive AE. We'll talk about them here in a moment. Uh, so I have, you know, you can read it. It's not all that exciting, it's just me. So I have about 10 years experience in the AE field in general. Um, I used to be an AutoCAD geek and then I turned into a Revit uh, resource and now I'm the BIM disciplinator here at the, the company, so I help to manage and try to orchestrate all of our BIM use and, and new technologies and all that fun stuff. And uh, then, uh, uh, and now we're, we're broaching into the, the ability to do presentations and to start sharing some of the knowledge and the development that we've done. Joe, I'm gonna pop over. Hi, I have been working Actually, at Progressive AE for 14 years, almost exclusively in Revit, kind of just building. It was for first five to six years, it was for one client only. But um, I've been working in Revit, developing it behind the scenes for 14 years. Built, and my biggest focus has been on Revit families and developing them to uh, just to make our lives easier as we build in the model and make it everything go quickly. So I'll go back to Christopher. So as Joe said, we're trying to make things easier, both on ourselves as the ones who make the, the, make the tools, uh, though obviously you'll see that's a negative <laughs> what we do, <laughs> but mostly for our users. A uh, little bit of progressive AE. So again, you can read the stuff. So we have, we're in most states, we have over 10 markets that we work in, we're full service, um, AEC, we have 59 years experience, right? We're celebrating our 60th coming up this next year. Um, and we're based here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And then we have uh, another office in Charlotte, North Carolina. All right, great. So the class, Revit Inception, who's it for? So it's for everyone, but we can't say that. So architectural, uh, predominantly, because that's where we both come from. Uh, we have the background. So uh, Joe has been an architectural technician and the BIM, you know, focus for uh, quite a while, but specializing in the architectural side. And then I am an architect. So uh, again, I come from that back end, background. So, uh, but a lot of it is parallel where you can pull concepts from the architectural cases that we'll show uh, to some of the others. We are going to assume that you have a background in family creation. We're not necessarily going to touch on all of the best practices or methods that we use. There's plenty of good sessions out there that do do that. And, um, and if there aren't, or you feel like there's a better one that we could do, then by all means, let us know, because we're always looking for ideas on what to present and how to help the industry in general. Um, and then additionally, if those of you who caught it, so Inception was a movie that came out in 2010, which I had to look that up. because It's ridiculous, ridiculously old in my mind. Uh, but uh, you don't need to know the movie at all to understand what we're talking about here. So don't worry about that. Now remember, what we're going for is to help people be as efficient as possible. Uh, and I, you know, one of my credos, I'm not lazy, I'm just energy efficient. I try to be as efficient in what I'm doing as possible. I think all of us can attest to how important that is. Uh, even you know, disregarding the jokes, we wanna be as efficient as possible because there's more and more that we're uh, attempting to do every day. Quick schedule. So we're gonna do, uh, start kicking into the overview here in a moment. Then we're gonna talk about the system families and uh, nesting in them and how that's important. And then uh, what we've called optional nested families. And I do that because uh, we've called it optional rather than loadable or something like that because some of them are still nested. It's just our adoption or adaptation of it that is going to help us in 
um, their use and to add that level of, of importance for usability. Learning objectives, and again, this is a little bit more straight from MU, right? We, we list that, whereas this is a little bit different being virtual. Uh, but what we're here is we're trying, trying to talk about how to use the nested families, where and why and when we would use them, and at the end, where and why and when we wouldn't use them. So inception, starting out. So inception is the idea. This have, does have a spoiler, so if you're trying not to listen, you actually want to watch the movie from 11 years ago, you can. Uh, so inception is a starting point. Um, or it's, it's the seeding or planting of an idea is how, how it came up with. So the idea that we came up with the name of it is because within the movie, they dive de deeper and deeper within the subconscious to try to uh, more or less plant an idea. Now for us, for Revan Inception, what we're talking about is the depth that we get in a family and getting deeper and deeper in putting a family in a family in a family in a family. Um, there's a variety of fun parallels and um, analogies that you could come up with for that, but I'm going to stick with the inception one. So uh, the idea is that um, we have multiple hidden, they functionally uh, act as hidden layers because they are deeper into the family itself that still populate out to the front that, to give you greater use. Um, and additionally, another parallel between inception and revenue inception is that the deeper you get, the more confusing it is and the crazier things get. It's also true, especially if you've seen the movie. All right, so why would we do this? Why do we nest families? Well, the, the basic one, and that's not even on the list, is because we have to. There are certain elements that we just have to do it within, and uh, that's mostly what I'll be covering here in, in our adaptation or use of them. But it's our goal, one of our goals, is to make it as easy to use for the user as possible so that they can use a, a family or a group of families to get what they need. Um, we want consistency and we want accuracy. So we kind of tried to, to plan these on the show. So we have the accuracy, we want it to be modeled close to real life. Um, I'm not talking like LOD and more hunger or something crazy. Uh, we're not doing fabrication here, but we do need to make sure that things are conveyed and uh, communicated the way they need to be. We want consistency, right? Standard sizes and shapes, you can't just make up uh, something. That's one of the major failures and is my concern, right? Personal opinion on um, say, families in general in Revit, right? You can get a furniture family, you can decide that you want it to be three inches taller. Well, they don't make that, therefore you just, you know, made either something super expensive or impossible. So being able to do standard sizes and shapes uh, offers a, a great deal of consistency that we can do, not to mention branding and your own, the, the own nature of, of what you have for what you're producing out of your company. Flexibility, so we need to support ourselves uh, two people here who tried to support our families as we created them and templates and all that, uh, speaking definitely from experience that we want to make sure that we are supporting our ability to fix them or to adjust them or to improve them uh, as we need to. Uh, flexibility also means to us the ability to you know, hot swap or adjust something really quickly. Uh, for instance, we're not using this as an example later, so I'll throw it out here, hopefully not stealing any thunder. Uh, but like say a door family or something, we can pop out and pop in a door panel style uh, because of the way we have it set up. Advancement, again, that kind of goes with the flexibility that I mentioned, just as far as being able to move it forward, right? You have to have a starting point before you can advance, but it's also trying to get us to those other uh, dimensions of BIM and uh, the use of the model itself. And then there are complex elements that just simply require it to happen and if you want to do it, right? If you want to place literally hundreds of uh, lockers, then by all means have fun. However, you could also just have them array in both directions, but that requires a nested family. That we actually will talk about later. All right, so starting the first thing. So uh, I'll, I'll say here because I didn't at the beginning because I'm kind of a failure at it. Uh, so I have Joe uh, sitting to the side here. He'll be helping to answer Q&A and chat uh, at, at, for anything that's relevant, at least. And then when he's presenting, I'll, I'll be doing the same. So we do have kind of a little uh, double prong here if anybody has any uh, questions or interest. By all means, throw them in the chat and QA um, so that we can't answer them because we want to. If they fit in stream, then, then we'll just interrupt each other with the idea. Otherwise, we'll answer questions at the end as well. Now. General uses, so the first case use for using a nested family. So uh, embedded, nested, uh, 
incepted, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's just a, a family within a family. And so the basic use that we need to do it are some of the system families within Revit itself. So within Revit, we have annotation families, a couple of them shown here, that require us to have nested families. For instance, the heads are nested. We'll talk about that here in a minute. We also have some basic modeling tools, what I call here simple, basic, either way, that allow us to and require us to have the nested family. So I've shown some reveals in some uh, sweeps that require that as well. So the basic use, so we're, we're going to talk about here the, uh, the annotation first. So the basic use is the idea that we have these elements that have to have something within them. So the basic components, and they're just built upon themselves. And again, this is the consistency side, right? The branding. So if you have a particular call out hat that you're supposed to use or that you know, your company has standardized on from back in the hand drafting days that we now have to convert to CAD, then convert to Revit, because that's how a lot of us are living. Uh, then that's how we can do it. And we can get that consistency so that it's in the template, it's in the library, it's all set and ready to go. This is a little bit insight into that annotation, right? So within the section callouts that we have, we can control what the different tags are or what the different uh, embedded elements are. So the callout tag and the section tag. And then within that, that's a type that uses a symbol. And so it's nested already. So we have the symbol inside the type, inside the type of callout. Again, it could be more confusing, but I'm trying not to. Basic modeling. This is a little bit more straightforward, so we can talk about that because honestly, diving into annotation, hopefully most people don't have to do that because the first time I did, it was super exciting, uh, but it was very confusing, right? What calls to what and how can you convert things and share things? Basic modeling is a little bit more straightforward. Within, uh, for instance, I'm showing the sweep. And again, I know there's at least two different ways to do sweeps. In Revit, you can have them embedded in the wall uh, structure itself, or you can have a standalone. We're talking about the standalone here because it's easier to see as an example. But within the sweep itself, you know, these are just kind of default generic sweeps, we can give it a profile. The profile itself is what we can control, help to control and to put it where we want to. So within the profile, there's a drop down that gives you the different shapes. You can create a profile family. We'll talk about that here in a moment. They can then load, and then you can use it again, position it, locate it, even apply materiality to it. And that allows us that nested ability. The reason this is important is going back to that consistency. There are standard profiles that we need typically in, in architecture, especially say bricks, brick reveals, etc. We want it to be, be the size of a brick and that's what it needs to be. So the ability to have it already as a profile, not something that somebody is drawing by hand or coming up with every time allows for that consistency and uh, efficiency, honestly, in, in our use. So Profiles, because so many of uh, the tools go back to profiles, particularly the system tools. And that's really what I'm talking about here. Uh, the system families themselves pull from profile families a lot. And I get to go into it. Um, so the accuracy, right? So that we have standard safe and sizes, consistency that they are um, all, always drawn that way, right? So if you get it wrong, you get it wrong everywhere. Uh, but that way it can be uh, propagated from those who are in the know, point to myself as if I am, but not always. Uh, and we can you know, beseech those who are experts in it and then we can pull it back. Flexibility, so rather than doing a sketch, you can just kind of swap something in or out. Uh, I did give that an asterisk because it doesn't always the work, the work the way that you want to. We can get into that at the end too, because it's just a fun lesson learned slash wish, wish list item for Autodesk. Advancement. So again, all, I'm just hitting these top ones. So advancement, uh, we can get greater and greater detail, right? If we find that we've put in some particular profile and then we need to go back and specifically add, say, the drip on the bottom, right? Because that's important. We can add it and either swap it back in or add that same one and it'll just adjust all of them. Um, and again, this is for profile specifically that I'm talking. And then complexity, right? We can give it more and more complexity. Now, obviously that increases render time and it increases modeling time and all of that. Uh, however, sometimes it's incredibly important and that's what we want to do. That goes back to that flexibility, right? We may be paid to do an LOD 200 model. We may be paid our documents uh, at that time. We may be paid to do 300, 350 or more. And 
that complexity, the accuracy and the detail all go into that. So how do we do that? So we have these different, right, these different uh, families that we can start with. The uh, families themselves are set up in a way that helps us. So we have the profile family, which is our default family, which is amazingly open. Leave it that. Uh, profile hosted, so it gives you the host and a bunch of you know text notes. So those of us who have played with these uh, templates uh, will recognize a lot of them. The Mullion profile, we'll talk about that here in a moment. Rail centerline, we actually get to talk about that here as well. Wall faces, so if, you know the reveal has a wall face that you're associating it with because that's kind of something. Uh, and then a stair nosing because that's a special one. So we actually don't talk about stairs in this besides the fact of a couple of uh, salt and wound type comments later. Uh, so we have all of those uh, different profile families that we can start with. And uh, from what I've seen, and again, this is maybe just throwing my foot right in my mouth. Uh, a lot of these, if you start with one, you can still change it to another and get it to do what you want to. Now the hosting and that sort of thing might, might get wonky, but at least it allows you some flexibility. Um, and again, particularly if you start with profile and then try to evolve it into something else. All right, so we're going from the easy end. Yes, that was easy. Uh, the profiles to stairs and railings, which of course it feeds right into here as, as you will all see here in a moment. So stairs and railings. So this is just the default railing family, railing samples uh, file from Autodesk. As you can see, obviously they have some stairs in here to host it, but you can see the different railing families that we can get. And uh, this is something that we're looking at. This is starting to get more into those, the, the whys and the ways and the reason that we want them. Uh, railings, I'm actually a fairly large fan of railings, which is counter to probably most culture in Reddit now. Uh, but I like them. I like them because they're almost, in my mind, they're doing what like stairs should be doing. Because <laughs> stairs are, I'm just going to keep harassing those. They're, they're just not fun to work in. Um, but again, the mo main things that I want to get out of railings, I'm not going to talk about stairs, but kind of those. Uh, railings is that we want the accuracy, right? We want it modeled correctly or as correctly as we can. So we have something to at least trace or model or draw over and, and label. And we want flexibility, right? We need the ability to make what we want. That's my major downfall in it. And yes, I realize that railings, no, there's, there's no way to get the, get the modules, get the panels to do what we all know they should be able to do. And that's, we're gonna ignore that here for now because that's a big, big mess. Um, so a couple of disclosures I'll throw out here. This is not intended on you know, how to set up or all the different parts of railings. I'm more than happy to create a class for that. Uh, again, by all means, always looking for ways to help contribute or look into things uh, with the community. And um, I just wanted to say, I was gonna look at stairs and I did a, a swap to railings because stairs, Ultimately, you get not very far and you realize that the tool is just not where it needs to be and just is a big wish list item. So that's where I left it. Quickly here, uh, railings, you can see, um, and I mentioned Revit Pure, they're a great place to go to to take a look at um, the information in general on, on Revit. And uh, this, is, uh, this is pulled straight from them. So they have an example of railings and the different pieces and parts. Uh, mostly, they don't show termination, so I added that to the list. And then kind of how Revit creates them. So railings, as, as I mentioned here, they're often mis misused or misunderstood um, or not utilized even to, the, to what they could do. Um, they do seem to be improving, and I'll use definite air quotes on that one, uh, the railings every version of Revit, at least that I've seen. So there are, there are things that are being developed. Um, and I will say I hate hate, and I try not to use that word, although I, with Revit, it seems to come to mind very quickly. Um, I hate the project browser setup and the fact that they're kind of nested in really weird places and that sort of thing. But again, I can't control that, so I'm just working with what I have. So here I have listed, you can see the different, the different components that I have over here, and then how they are placed into the railing. And just, again, showing how everything is nested in here. So the, the only real difference, only real thing in, in the list that isn't a nested family is the extension, and that's a parameter within the nested family, within the range. So within each of these, uh, you can see uh, many of them, three of them particularly, the, all the rails are 
coming from the profile um, family that you load into a system family that you then load into the railing system family. The rest, uh, except for extension, are loadable families that you do from, again, that, that kind of templated uh, family uh, element. So within railings, uh, what I wanted to do here uh, fairly quickly to, to showcase is uh, that you can't, um, you can't do certain things in railings, so I'll, I'll just know that, uh, but you can do a lot and, and it starts to get to the point and, and people will talk about curtain walls here and we will in a moment, a moment but curtain walls, like as you start to diverge from using them correctly, you can get a lot more flexibility if you can get it to just do the way you want it to. So I have shown here the rail, that rail profile, so you can see what it is. And you'll notice that the, there are definite rules within it. But my example here is I'm using the rail profile to do just a glass, uh, a glass suite, more or less of what it is, that follows contours and what I want, maintaining the certain height. This allows us to go back and add detail over overlaying it. And no, that's not modeling true and no it's not going to give you the best rendering because it's just going to be a sheet of glass um, i could model anything else continuous right i could throw a handrail i could throw um, the top cap if that's what you you need uh, but the problem is that we run into this situation right we want our railings to be able to give us the panels and they don't yet and i'd say that's okay but it's just super annoying that they haven't gotten us anything like that that it's a flexible panel uh tool and yes that gets back to using curtain walls as that element and no, I'm not a huge fan of it. I, I tend to be truer and more pure in my Revit use, but again, I, I understand the reasons behind it. So just a couple of like takeaways or best practices here. So extensions, uh, we have some complex extensions. And again, I could go go and do a whole class on railings. I could do a whole class on, on, on stairs uh, and many people have, right? Uh, but you can get some pretty involved things by using terminations uh, instead of an extension that you can start to get those custom ones that you need, whether existing condition or, you know, a glam or a stair that you're trying to do. So this is just an example that I have to get this rail, which it's not, but to get the rail, um, it, it goes backwards. And that's one of the things I want to point out. You have to kind of think through the process and trial and error, in all honesty. But I can give, so the top rail, that's what it's marked as. So that's how the railing in Revit reads the top elevation. And so actually to adjust the height is we need to adjust the other uh, reference plane that I have here that pulls it down. And uh, so it's, it's counterintuitive, right? It grows from the top down rather than bottom up. Uh, but once you get that understood, then your railings will start reading correctly and the data that it's popping out uh, can be really helpful as we all get more and more into 360 and cloud versions and any other of the add-ins that allow us to see a 3D model and read the BIM out inf information from it, having an accurate height so that this doesn't go up that way and it's offset by three foot five, uh, giving us an overall height that would record at like six something in weirdness. Uh, we do not want that. And so being able to use it, even if it's backwards from our logic, it can be su supremely helpful. All right. Fairly certain this is actually quick, so we'll see. If not, Joe can just kick me out. <laughs> Coming up next. Uh, so curtain walls. Curtain walls are are I, I do like curtain walls too. And again, I know plenty of people do, and plenty of people don't. There's probably not a lot in the middle. Uh, but curtain walls are super flexible for what they are, and that's pretty amazing uh, because really they're only comprised of two things: panels and volumes. And yes, there's a lot of flexibility flexibility between between each of those, but it's having just two families. So the curtain panel that is defined in as a system family, and then the mullions, which are a loadable, often based off of profile, can be supremely uh, flexible and, and give you what you want. However, it does offer layers of attention that you need to give it. So by default, Revit's uh, profile for the, for the mullion is a rectangle. And it's very stupid and it does what it needs to kind of in elevation and basically in, in section or plan, but it's not giving us any of that information and it doesn't help with that too much. So you can make custom ones, right? Uh, out of the box forever, at least last I saw, does not have, say, the butt glazing or, or um, anything like that, which we use at least periodically enough that we've created our own knowing this for. But then you have to start controlling left versus right, top versus bottom, et cetera. 
So within here, that's all I'm going to touch on real, real quickly is that we you can create the custom lines. You can create custom panels too, although they tend to be a little bit more of what they are, and, and that's it. But the oopsie, sorry, the panels themselves and the mullions can be can be flexed. And so you can see, as many of you are already aware, the mullions can be adjusted, right? So we need a thinner mullion. We're doing, you know, we're going to use it as a wood sash on a wood window because that makes the most sense. Then that's what we can do, particularly for an existing condition. Although, again, that gets you very quickly to a place that you don't really want to be uh, because it doesn't perform the way that you expect it to. Go back, I didn't touch on it here in my first session. So, conceivably, I think I say here, uh, you could go through and model probably almost an entire building, at least architecturally, in curtain walls and curtain systems. I very strongly advise against that. That would be <laughs> horrible to manage. Uh, but I've seen people do it, and, and in my experience, not to throw anybody under the bus, but uh, a lot of times scan to model uh, companies will utilize the flexibility that curtain walls had within Revit to get what is needed out, but is not the most conducive to us doing our projects. For instance, we're currently living in an old historical building that was modeled from a scan that is all curtain walls for their window systems. And so now we have to convert them all, which is again, more work, not as much work as you know, literally going in and modeling the whole thing from start scratch, but more work. So by controlling the mullions themselves, we can load them and then change them. And you can change them on the fly and we can uh, change them universally. All right, enough of that. Like I said, I'm more than happy to answer questions um, or to address things or, hey, what about this at the end? And again, I don't know it all, but I'm always willing to learn. And that's really what, what's positioned us in, in this way is that we want to learn and try and you know, kind of try to break it. Normally not while we're actually working in the project, say normally, uh, but a lot of times we're just trying to get better and better at what we're doing and so we investigate. Next, uh, I'll turn it over here to Joe and you can listen to him for a while, so me. All right, so I am, part of, um, I'm going to show you a couple of uh, how these families will work nested with nested stuff. So um, basically I'm going to go into three examples and show you how our curtain walls and you can kind of see like we have our curtain walls and then we have the three different detail levels of view and we can change how they're viewed in those situations. Um, windows and I can show you how we did this is one window family that can do all these different window types that are just easily swappable because we're nesting in the different types. And then uh, thirdly, the locker arrays. Well, a lot of locker families so we can show you how um, using nest families works with um, uh, to be able to do multiple multi-array. So if I switch over to there's Revit. So um, in Revit, Everybody can see Revit screen, I'm assuming. Um, no. So, uh, so our Revit, uh, I built this curtain wall system. This is a. Right. We don't see Revit. You don't see Revit? No. Uh, share Revit. Share. How about now? Cool. All right. So, Revit. This is our, our curtain wall family. This one is designed off of, if I click it, it'll tell me that uh, Conair system was just a default one to look at. But if you look at these, you can see that it looks very generically like, in, or in 3D, it looks very generically like the out of the box curtain wall families with just a rectangular profile. The glass stops at the mullion, it doesn't go into it, whereas in real life it would go into it. But if you if we take this and we look at it into in um, in, the, in details, I did the course um, um, fine details. You can you can get in and you can see that it is all you can see all the little profiles, and that is done. Basically, we took the I take the rectangle profile and nest in a detail family into the profile so that you see the lines of it. You see the the glass panel goes into it and all lines up so that when you need that detail, it's there. But when you look at it in like a, a medium view, it is basic. You you don't you're not mudding up your your 
plan or your plans, your details, the lines that you don't need. And then if your course where you, like a lot of times we have this where it's the walls are all solid colors, we use those profiles to add in that solid into the, the curtain wall because if you do a standard out of that curtain wall, it it shows like it what we show in our medium. So that would be how inserting in these details as a nested family helps speed up detailing out your detail views so that you can you don't have to then load in a pro a detailed family and insert it in. It's already built into it, but it's also not weighing down your model with drawing this profile exactly as it is. And you can show a lot more detail that way. Um, and then we can look at the window families. So again, live look at these window families, you can see that I click it, I have um, built into this family, we have head and sill header or sill and header profiles. We can, um, if you hit, I, you can see that these are a single hung, but if I select all of these, they're just different types of the same window family. And that is done because we nested in a bunch of different families into one family so that we can control it with parameters. So we have, you can turn on exterior trim or interior trim, depending on um, what is going on with finishes around the window. Um, you can, we have a, a nailing flange modeled in, but if you have a situation where you don't have that, you can turn that off. But then this, the main power is because we're nesting in the different window types, we have this little drop down that allows us to select what type of window is in there. And we don't have to change when we don't have to load another window family. We can just you can have say all your prod all your window D's in your project are this window, but we want to change it. You just kind of come in, change the type. You can swap it from a single hung to let's say a casement and click OK, and everything changes on the thing. And because we're nesting all that stuff in, you don't have to load another family. It's there. You can. It, it's it's much faster on model, managing that model. And every place where that type is used, it will then swap out. But what that because we have those that window insert into there, then we can go into the situation like this, where we have multiple windows nested into one family. So like this is a window ribbon where it's the same window repeated however many times we say it needs to be, but so here's four, here's three, and it's one family. We can just kind of swap out how many, and you can, again, using the same setup, you can come in here and say window type, you can just change it, and we can go, say, change that from a fix to a double hung. Click OK. This might take a second, but it's easier than, it's quicker than in other, um, having to do this all manually. And so now you have a row of double hung. Um, this also works. So this is all one family, and these are five different si situations where you can see it's there's four window types, and we have them just a couple of different layout options. But each one of these panels is then swappable with different types. So you, I come in here and I have it laid out which which location, and you can say this shouldn't be a double hung. This should be a fixed. We should. This, there shouldn't be, it should be all fixed except for the one on it. Click OK. And it comes in and it'll take a second. And then it, you can see now, OK, we have the awning. So again, this get, just gets back to the power of it's there, it's modeled, and it's easy to change if a change needs to happen. But it also, it can now be tagged as one window type. We can then you can take that window type and easily set it into your as a legend component into your legend and if you change it in the model it changes the legend component that kind of it all talks back and forth and it's a quicker change than having to change window families out again these are just more different options so this is just side by side and i have it set up so that if you did casement on both sides they would be mirrored so that the hinges would be on the outside kind of situation um, and then you can also, just, I have one that's just two stacked on top of each other. 
again, that's one, two, three, four, five different window families that kind of that all use the same nested window component that insert it that lets us select it. It also is the same window trim and head and, and sill detail. Um, and again, because of because we're nesting those families in, it's all easily swappable. And then, then we have the locker family. And this Before is, we move on, we got a good question. Okay. Um, are there options to show these windows and their com composition of nested families inside of a schedule? Um, you, uh, I think so. I've not. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was getting to, too. Uh, I, I believe you can, because it is just a parameter setting. Um, you, um, again, if you look at it. Yeah, we're getting responses from others saying use of shared parameters and of course yeah. filters should be able to yeah, get to and it because these are just parameter these are just type selection parameters so as long as those are schedulable you can drop that information in the schedule i've not tried it so i can't i can't guarantee that it can work but i would assume it can but that's a dangerous thing to do is assume on that um And then, okay, so any other questions on the windows? Nope, we're good. Okay. We got some good responses too, though. Thanks for everyone yep. chipping in as well. Uh, so now this is the locker family. So basically what I what I have in here is I have a single, this is one locker family. It's an array where I can control how big the locker is and then how many high, stacked high it is. And I think, yeah. And a lot of these are instance parameters so that you can just, the size is a type, but then like there's lots of different options that we have nested because again, because of nested, we can array this, it's one locker family that has a bunch of different options, but then that same locker family is nested into one array, which is then nested into another because, <laughs> because of how Revit likes to do arrays. So let me just open up this family and I can kind of show you quick. Um, there's obviously there's a lot of things going on in here. Um, let me just so we get it done here. You can see that I have this vertical array as in here, but if you it's in if you edit this group, you'll notice that this is a nested family because Revit doesn't let you take one family and array it in two directions in 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 the same family, you have to nest. The only way to get it to function and control and lock together appropriately, you have to nest this. So again, I can edit this and where's edit. Um, so now we get in and we're into a nested family in here. And then now there's this locker family that is nested in. And then, so again, this is the locker family, but then I have it nested into multiple different families to be able to do the array. So here we can do the horizontal array, and then that horizontal array is nested in to do the vertical array. And then that just allows us the quick and easy flexibility to then come into here and say, well, this needs to fill a space of, where is it? Um, it needs to fill 10 feet of space instead of, I don't remember what it was before, um, five. So now it just kind of, it you can control that, that array and it just fills that space. And instead of having to have that, that locker family multiple times in this array, it, or in, in the family, you have one family that does a multiple of the arrays. Um, and then we can also, if you click on here, because we know how many over and how many high we're arraying the family, it will give you a count that then you can schedule that count into a schedule. So it, like, a, it, it's, it's an e easy information we can have scheduled that's accurate on our thing. Um, again, also because the message is this, um, the, the hardware, the vents, the door itself, those are all nested 
components inside that allow us to have a very powerful and flexible family that can do lots of different things in one and not have to maintain multiple um, layouts. So for those of you playing at home, I think we got to three or four levels on that one. And oh, we can, and that's that, and this is just the locker. So now this door is a nested. And then if you go into this door, then this family is a nested family. These are nested families. And there's another type of lock that I have in here that's nested. So, so this, five or six. Yeah. Oh, and then you can go if, if I open up that that view instead of. I have this door swing, which is a, a symbol that I have built to use in multiple locations. Because it, as you see, it says door breakout swing symbol it's because I wanted a hidden line. So it's this is another nested family that if you want to keep going deeper, you can then the door panel part of it is nested too, so that it can do the swing. So I don't know how far deep we went, but one. <laughs> Three, so the, four, the moral five, of this story is that Joe is insane. Seven. That's seven deep that I went on this family to do a to just to make it as simple as possible for, for the, the user. End, user, end user. It's always more complicated for the person building it, but my goal has never been to make it simple for myself. It's I'm always trying to make it simple for the end user because if I spend a little bit of time now, the end user spends less time and gets the work done quicker. So we have, I, see, do we have anything else? I, that was all I want, was gonna show you. So let's, oh, I think I need to switch controls. Where are my sharing? Where's the sharing? There's the share. Let's go back to that one, that one. So I think the PowerPoint should be back up. Yep. We're good. All right. I'm going to let Christopher take back over. So thank you for the good comments and, and everything. And, uh, as I mentioned, our, our information will be at the end of this too with our email addresses and we're both on LinkedIn. So you're welcome to connect either way. Um, I'm not sure how much we'll be able to share, but I have, I have some other things percolating in my mind too. So we might be able to do something else. So uh, by all means, reach out. Um, so I wanted to, to finish up talking here about uh, some of some of the, where we are now, what we're looking at, and, and what's moving forward. So the first thing is limitations, right? The things that we know uh, we can't do, or or what we're waiting for, um, and then I put kind of wish list items there too, because some of it we we know what we want to do, and Autodesk just hasn't given us the ability yet. Not that any of us are familiar with that concept. So the biggest thing, one of the biggest things we had was our countertop family. We were desperately hoping to try to figure out a way to add grommets and turn them on and off and to add penetrations, for instance, a sink, so that when we render it, we don't have to either map or create a special custom casework family just to have a hole in it, et cetera. Um, so that was not possible until Revit 2021, where you can actually give visibility parameters to, uh, to um, sorry, voids within families that will allow you to cut it. So that, that we got, we got, woo, we got something. Um, then stairs, because I want to just drive this one into the dirt because it's really annoys me, is that st stair family, while I, I appreciate the complexity that they have uh, just innate to what they are, it's something that we can't model what we intend to see or what even close to what kind of like shop drawings are. And I'm talking like concrete metal pan stairs. We can make do with like two by four open treads. That's that's not a big deal. But it's the it's the other ones that we, that we use um, that that would be really great to be able to have it. Now I'm I'm not talking about anything by necessarily going to um, those of you who, who are stair geeks like I kind of am apparently. Um, there's a there's a website called stairporn.org. Um, don't go on your company computer. It's it's totally legitimate. I'm, I'm telling you this, but it's obviously going to red flag someone. But it's a great website. Uh, that has like really cool staircases. So if you're ever like really trying to stretch yourself, figure out how they model that or how they would model it in Revit. Uh, but again, those stairs are the ones that I really want to be able to do. And really the only way that you can do a lot of those is, you know, model in place, mass elements, that sort of thing, which really isn't the right answer as far as I'm concerned. All right, 
Coupled with that is, is we've gotten to learn when not to use some of these things. So for instance, in my early days when I was young and stupid, um, maybe overly excitable, whatever, um, I tried to make a chain link fence. All right, that's not true. I succeeded in making a chain link fence family comprised of a curtain wall that had all of the actual chains modeled. It was really fun. I got to learn a lot. Uh, it was useless because it bogged down the model so much. And this was just not even for a lot of, a lot of chain link. Um, it bogged down the model so much that it really um, became laborious and, and wasn't getting us any benefit, right? I don't need to measure the linear length of how much, you know, how, how much wire we need. So there wasn't a reason to, to necessarily model that. And that's one of the things to take into account, like what you're trying to get out of it, right? So if you want like realistic rendering, uh, there's a better way to do that for, again, chain link fences as an example, you know, using the correct material type, uh, invis invisibility materials, uh, generally just getting a better renderer than Revit out of the box. Not that it's necessarily horrible, but there are better ones. Uh, you know, all those can play into it. And you can start getting into like real ones, right? Through used to do Max and stuff staying in the same ecosystem. Uh, you can start getting better rendering information and the ability to do that, let alone all the VR development and that, that which is going on now. Uh, the use of materials, that's what we do for chain link fences now, right? So we have the frame and then we just have kind of this X grid uh, material that goes into it. Because again, as long as it's decent enough material that we've applied, the rendering does, does well with it. And then uh, the complexity of the necessity. So uh, Joe's example is a great one uh, with the lockers uh, and related to the casework. So casework here I have, all right, we're modeling poles now, right? We have a couple different poles that we can hot swap back and forth. Um, we can add a new pole type as long as it's based on the same uh, reference planes and starting point that will grow and be in the right location. Uh, but we're not modeling locks, right? We don't need that. Uh, we're modeling a circle uh, that's a, a, a model line that's showing us what, what it is because that's all we need to do to represent it and that, that functions for what we need. Um, however, uh, Joe's example, the um, lockers. So we have the different locking mechanisms there that are swappable. Again, kind of the poles equivalent of the casework because they're different. They look completely different and they would render differently too because that's part of our world, our ecosystem now is the ability to do 2D and 3D views kind of ad hoc whenever we need and see something that's at least pretty close to accurate. And if we just drew the little outline that has the, the recess with the uh, finger pole, that's, that's not going to render correctly. It's going to look fake and weird. And that's not what we're going for. However, the vents, we didn't model the vents, right? We modeled them as lines so that we can show them right there, but we didn't necessarily model holes in, in faces because again, it's more to render and, and we don't see the benefit from that. So it's, it's walking that line. And that's, that's why I have some of these um, expected uh, FAQs uh, that we wanted to do based off of those lessons learned is you need to balance everything. And, and a lot of it's your own workflow, your company's workflow, what the benefits are to you. And, and we understand that, right? We're speaking from our perspective and our company. Um, so uh, I, I mentioned the necessity complexity, working backwards now again. Um, if you don't need to show polls at all, then don't show polls. Like that's, don't waste the, the, um, the kilobytes of data that you need for it, particularly when you're, you know, you're modeling a school and you have a bunch of blockers. All right, if you don't need that, then that's going to save quite a bit by, by not having that extra complexity. And that, that leads back to the, the first point I have here. It's, it's too deep. Um, so what is, what is too deep? So we got like seven plus depth in that, um, in that particular family for the lockers. Right. And again, the necessity of it was required in order to do the, the repeating in both directions, the array in both directions, it just required it. So it gave us like two layers automatically, just what we needed. Um, but it does get heavier, right? The, when we swap our windows, as Joe was demonstrating earlier, it takes a while for it to process. He, I mean, you saw it actually took a while, I'm saying a second or two, uh, when he did it. And that was a small model where we had just a few instances. As you get into a larger model, it's a bigger, it's a bigger hole. And so you have to do that balance, right? We get to a point that we've learned, and it's honestly a lot of touch and go and a lot of practice and trial that we need to break things out. And we just decide, you know what, that it just needs to be a separate family and that's what it is. And that's not the end of the world as long as we create those correctly as well, right? We're not looking, well, we are looking for silver bullet, but we're not gonna find it. So we're looking for the best way that we can balance what we need. And then the flexibility versus simplicity, right? That's where kind of what I alluded to by splitting something to a different family. Um, 
sometimes that's just what the answer is, right? It doesn't make sense to have 17 nested different types of windows in one window family, just have different types. If that's what you're doing or you need the speed, right? You're trying to model in front of somebody, you're doing concept design, you don't want to wait for it to think. You need to be able to swap it faster. Then you might need something, something different. So that's, again, it's a lot of fit yourself needs, uh, which is unfortunate, right? I hate those lessons learned where you're like, well, we can't tell you. Uh, but a lot of it is there and, and it's, it's painful to learn them, but that's why we, and I mentioned this in the chat earlier, uh, test, test, test all, all of the families uh, because we always, we consistently break our own families and try to, um, well, whether we try to or not, we break our own families so that we can do it before somebody else does. And uh, then it's not a fire, it's just something that we have to address. There's a question in the chat here real yeah. quick. Um, how do you prevent users from inadvertently upgrading or <laughs> lock? Do, you, do we lock? How do, how do we prevent any of that? Uh, yeah, we don't. <laughs> um, I don't know of a way to lock it. So we are looking at a couple tools. This isn't necessarily the, the way that we need to talk about it, but there are a couple of tools out there that are starting to introduce the ability to either lock down. Um, they're intended right now for um, ecosystem infrastructure within your system. So what, what I mean by that, because there's big words I just threw out there, what I mean by that is within your company, as long as people have the program installed, it helps them to not make the mistakes. However, if you share a model out, then it unlocks the, the families or whatever as it is. Um, so one of those is like Project Frog, if anybody's familiar with that. Um, it's a pretty cool tool that can help you lock down within your company, some of those standards and that sort of thing. If you're looking to be able to like kind of watermark or lock something before you share it, as far as I know, nothing exists like that. I'm regularly looking on the lookout for it. So if anybody does know of anything, I'm more than all ears. Um, but we're constantly looking at that as right as, as what it is to, you know, proprietary da data and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we put a lot of man hours into developing these. Um, and that, that's great, right? We're showcasing them, but our next steps are even better, and even more fun and um, trying to keep driving forward, right? The door family that I alluded to earlier, we're, we're redeveloping our door family again and again, uh, but this time we're doing it with this mindset, right? So we can swap things out and flex. And saying that uh, accidentally lock up, locking it from being upgraded is, I accidentally up, upgraded a model or family the other day that I had to go back into and yeah, backwards because I updated it to a, Rubber version that we're not using in the company yet, so yeah. I like I have to go back in and fix that model now. But yeah. luckily, there's backup, so I can I can pull that backup. But. Exactly, and that is one of the things we do here. It's an IT infrastructure thing, but we do have backups. We do lock down our our library uh, drive that only certain people can even write to it, so they can't accidentally back up and monitor that. And we're actually uh, in the process of or finishing up the adoption of a content management system, so even more so people can't accidentally. Um, modify anything um they can do so project specifically but again we can save that a lot easier than we can at large and, and as far as i know there's another question coming in there's no way to keep a company from borrowing your proprietary families from a shared bin 360 hosted model nope not that i know of no nope. and once it's on bin 360 it's there so if you uploaded your starter model for, to begin with and then you purchase it they still have access to the old ones so if not your hub they still have it so just like just like emailing it or, or uh, sending, well, email probably wouldn't work for any friend. <laughs> uh, but you know, FTP exchanging or sending somebody a thumb drive with your model once they have it, they have it. So that's what it is. Um, I was hoping that Bin360 would give us something like that. They don't. I mean, we use it, and we, there's nothing that we found that way either. So um, we're consistently trying to do it, but we're also of the mindset we're trying to share and get along with everyone. So it's it's that fun, fun line that everybody gets to live in uh, nowadays is what we're sharing. All right, so we're gonna stick around here. Happy to answer more questions and everything. Uh, that is all of our content. Uh, Justin, I'm not sure if you had anything you wanted to wrap up with or not before everyone truly does run away, but. Do we use container files? I pop up. Do we use container files for developing families? Kind of. So uh, we use a container family, it was uh, even more kind of, right? It's nuanced even more. So we have a container file that manages your content management system so that those can go there because we need to for system families. Otherwise, we do have a standalone offshoot fam uh, library and model that is just for us testing. So we alpha test, we beta test, then we kind of small group beta test, and then we then release it. Uh, 
And sometimes, yes, the alpha test is when somebody specifically re requested a family. They're like, well, we think it works. Um, <laughs> well, that's not if it doesn't. <laughs> yep, good luck. And then we're, you know, we're kind of on call and able to, to fix things up. So we do, we do have it within our own ecosystem of our group that can do it. And we regularly invite um, somebody to come in and try to break it. One of our other Revit, you know, experts to come in and say, hey, you know, run it through its courses to make sure that those. And so we have a container file for that, right? That they just say, and we purge it regularly, right? Because who knows what's going to <laughs> crud it up later. So we'll you know, just run. kill it, pull a new template, and, and we'll load it that way. Good questions. Nice having some good conversation, too. Yeah, let's, uh, let's give it a couple more minutes for questions, if anybody has any more questions. And then, um, then we'll shut it down. I'm just going to keep this up for our contact yeah. information. Somebody's suggesting bury a watermark deep in it so you know if somebody does actually. We can, yeah. The problem is, like, from, and again, this is my experience, and I'm not a lawyer, and all that normal rigmarole that people have to say with that. Like, it, sure, but what are you going to do? Right. I mean, uh, there's so much. Yeah, technically, there's language in there that you can't share, can't duplicate. But as far as I know, like, copyright laws are so loose in our discipline and, well, our field that. I'm sure you can figure it out. It'd be more for your own knowledge, right? And that's what I've heard other people do, even from their own, uh, right? So I made this, right? I just want to know what Christopher made. And so I'll put like my name in tiny text way, way, way down deep somewhere in a hidden field to flock that no one can see. And then you can go in uh, on the back end in, uh, and edit the file itself and actually delete a parameter. So it's truly a hidden parameter and you can't find it. So then you could get it back if you needed to. Um, that's a lot of work for like, as far as I'm concerned, not a lot of benefit. I mean, yeah, we put a lot of development into this, but our goal is to advance the industry, right? If, if we're out here leading in some of this stuff and there's plenty of others leading in other things, I mean, that's what these kind of conferences and conversations are about is so that we can all grow together, right? Um, so, you know, if you made, as you know, even if you're competing architectural firm, you made a, a really awesome thing execution plan or contrarily a horrible one that you really, really paid for over and over again. I don't really want other somebody else to have to go through that pain either. So again, that's that's my personal take. Um, somebody's asking what we use to allow us locking within families within our own company, and that's we're transitioning over to Hive currently, which will allows that. Yeah. So. We're, but then we are have a network drive that is locked down. To, yeah, we have a network drive that is locked down by IT that only gives certain permissions for write on it. Everybody has read access. Not everybody has write access. Um, and so that's that's what we've lived by so far. We are transitioning to a cloud version where once again, certain people have kind of a write access or a edit access and everyone else has read only. Although in Hive and a lot of them with AL Unify, they have you know, kind of feedback features too, which is really convenient as well. People can say right in situ, hey, this family's broken or I don't like it or whatever. Uh, so that's, that's what we do. So we, we lock it down that way. If you're looking at something a little bit broader reaching, um, or you're looking to try to consolidate in different pieces, right? So it's more than a family and say, you know, a typical unit block, or, you know, maybe you're the, you're the architect of record or keeper of the standard for say a uh, hospitality group, uh, Project Frog would be a good, I would recommend looking at them at least and that can lead you down the path of some competitors or others that do that as well, that you can lock down say a group or, or, or family or, so, or more than family, grouped families that can be repeated and not edited. Um, and there was a follow-up to that one, but yeah, once a, once a Revit family file is loaded into a Revit model that somebody has access to, they have access to that Revit family. Yes. There's, there's no way to prevent that. Yeah, and that would be the project frog element. That's, that overlays uh, kind of a permissions, I guess, for lack of a better term. Um, as far as being able to do it even within the family, even in the loaded model itself and what you can do. And I keep mentioning that one. That's the one that I'm most familiar with and the one that I know of from, you know, conferences there at AU, whatever, four years ago. Um, and I saw their booth and everything. So they're, they're one of the ones that's leading that way. I, I believe there are other ones out there. Um, and we're looking at them. I think Guardian might be one system as well, uh, but they may lock down standards more than families. Good questions. And yes, yeah, we're constantly fighting too. So. Perfect. Well, um, we're at the top of the hour, so I think we'll go ahead and shut it down. 
Um, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, Chris and Joe, thank you so much for doing this. This was this was really great. This was a great presentation. Well, it was definitely a pleasure. I appreciate it. And thanks for everyone for joining. We had upwards of 50 people there for a while. So that was pretty exciting. So I appreciate it, everyone. And like I said, this is contact information. We're happy to happy to reach out, connect, LinkedIn connect, it's fine. Drop a note so I know who you are. Uh, so I have a list of everyone who's here. Uh, so yeah, I saw you, uh, whatever, but happy to connect too. So thanks a lot, Justin and ATG for everything too. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, guys.